We have two readings today that offer us alternative visions for creation. The first one comes from the book of Genesis. And it is the part of the Genesis creation narrative that talks about the creation of, uh, of male and female within, within the universe, within God's <coughs> creation. And what's interesting about that is the original term for man before this moment is non-gendered. It is understood to be a human being. And only when female is created is there un- this understanding of male and female. I thought I'd just throw that out as a little, <laughs> a little gobbit for you to, to think about this week. But the more important message for us today, I think, in this particular reading, deals with this notion of humanity's place within creation, humanity's role. And this Genesis narrative, where it describes humanity's dominion over nature, rather than stewardship is an important distinction. Because what it really gets at is this notion that we human beings rule creation. That there is a hierarchy of importance and power in which humanity is in charge and we get to call the shots. So there's that first vision from creation, which I find rather problematic given our current sort of ecological concerns. And we're going to talk about this next week as well, because, uh, or two weeks actually, because Deacon Derese has arranged for us to have a guest speaker to talk about ecological theology, um, the theology of creation and how we care for that creation uh, for our Harry Potter's um, classes. The second reading from the Gospel of Luke actually gives a countervailing perspective, which is that God is in control. It is not humanity that is in control of creation. It is God that is in control of creation. What's really important about this Luke reading is it, in some ways it kind of puts humanity in its place. Because the reflection is on our incessant obsession to try to control, to control everything, to provide for ourselves, to make sure that we got everything arranged just so we become preoccupied with providing for our needs. And there is a kind of arrogance, hubris in that, this notion that, you know what, we can take care of number one. We can do this all by ourselves. And the model that's provided in this reading is really a gentle pastoral one. It's not condemning humanity for its arrogance, for thinking that it's self-sufficient, for thinking we've got this word control, but really more about, uh, about trying to comfort humanity, which is, of course, preoccupied with providing for the basic necessities of life. I mean, there's this understanding, isn't there, that life is fragile. And when we go through adversity in particular, we have this sense that, God, it could all fall apart in the twinkling of an eye. It could. You know, if I lose my job, I lose my health insurance, or I could, you know, a m- one mortgage payment away from losing the house. Um, you know, I could go to the doctor for an annual wellness checkup and find out I've got cancer. Uh, anything could happen. We are fragile. And so what God is telling us is, you know what, if you, if you become overly preoccupied about those kinds of things, you're going to suck all the joy out of life. If you become so anxious that all you can focus on is what might happen if, and become so driven by your need to control, then you're just going to be a neurotic mess. And you're going to fail to see that that, that God has provided so much for you to be thankful for, so much of the necessities of life. Which isn't to say that humanity is not responsible for doing something with that gift. But we have to understand, first of all, that that, that gift is, is not of our creation. The gift comes from God. And the way that we accept it faithfully, I guess I would say, is to, is to understand 
that it, it was never ours in the first place. That it is pure gift. It is pure gift. That even the lilies of the field have been provided for with rain and soil. And so that should, that should give us comfort and that should give us encouragement. But there's another piece of this. So when you hold that first reading from Genesis and the reading from Luke in tension, it's, it's difficult to miss this, this essential tension between, on the one hand, our complete sort of helplessness, our vulnerability as created beings. But on the other hand, having this position of some agency and power that places upon us responsibility, places upon us responsibility for the care of creation. And this, this gets at this shifting of our mindset from this obsession with control and dominion, dominion over all creation. How many times have we heard that? To rule creation, right? As opposed to saying, no, no, no. You're a created being. You're mortal flesh. You're ashes. You're dust, just like the lily of the field. You ain't special in that respect. We have all of, all of us, every created thing has that in common. But you do have a unique place in creation to care for that creation because you have been given unique gifts by the creator. And I think we have to challenge a lot of the language we use with respect to our role, our place in creation. I mentioned last week that our words have power. The words that we use matter. They really matter. And I think no more so now than now, when we have to check ourselves, oh, was that a, a racist thing that I said uh, accidentally? <laughs> was it a, a sexist thing that I said? Uh, was it insensitive to somebody with a different background than mine? This is a good reflective exercise. Um, and so the same is true in our praying life, the words that we use in prayer. And just to give you an example, because you're all good Episcopalians, you will recognize this in a, in a flash. The words that we use in the Eucharistic prayer, the different Eucharistic prayers that we use when we consecrate bread and wine. Prayer B says, we give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation. Lovely, lovely theology. In creation, dear Lord, you have made your love and your goodness known, felt, perceived. In Eucharistic prayer C, lovingly known as the Star Wars prayer, because it has a very 70s sort of feel to it, it really does. Go, go and read it, you'll be like, okay. That's why I don't use it particularly all that much. Although the theology of it is rather lovely, but it does at one point say, you made us the rulers of creation. And I always sort of bristle at that. I bristle at that. Well, yes, you may, I don't know that you made us rulers of creation or whether we just took it upon ourselves to rule creation. And thanks to us, we have things like nuclear war and famine and poverty and disease and the rest of it. So I don't know how well we've used that power, whether it was given to us by God or we've just seized it for ourselves in our arrogance. And then in prayer D, which is that really long one, remember, that we do in Easter season. And you're like, gosh, when is this going to be over? It's like, how long does this go on? Um, I think it's a beautiful prayer, but it is rather long. The words go, you formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care. Ooh, that's lovely. But wait. So that in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. So you can see in prayer D, which is an ancient Eastern Orthodox prayer, prayer of St. Basil the Great, you have this tension between rule and serve. What does it mean to rule and serve? And might there be a better word than rule? Because this notion of rule and serve gets at this duality between authority on one side and accountability and responsibility for the way we use that authority on the other and holding those intention responsibly, prayerfully, faithfully, humbly, humbly. And I think what's important about that tension is that it draws our gaze to the ways in which we fail. And not out of any sense of guilt or shame or, or anything like that, although there are times when that is present, but really more 
as a reaffirmation of, of our ability to impact, our ability to transform, for good or for, or for ill. And I think what's extraordinary about that, that Luke reading, but that God has provided for the lilies of the field and they are clothed with beauty just as you are. And so are you any less important? Why do you have so little faith? Why do you have so little um, faith in God's ability to care? Well, I think one of the things that we miss is that God has embedded within creation the power for, self, uh, for our self-preservation. So that reading from Luke draws our attention to the fact that embedded within creation is the ability to shape it, that we are co-creators with God. God did create all things, and maybe he didn't make us rulers, but made us stewards and said, look, I have, I have embedded within creation the ability for this to continue. And it's up to you now to figure out how to do that. I have given you free will, I've given you a conscious, a moral compass to guide how you interact with creation. And hopefully, my dear beloved creatures, you will understand that you are not more important than the lilies of the field. But I have endowed you with special gifts that have put upon you a great responsibility to care, not just for yourselves in self-interest, but for everything I have created. You are not rulers, but stewards. That's why we call the time at the end of the year when we ask people to pledge stewardship. It's caring for something that's been entrusted to us, something that is precious, that needs nurturing, that needs to be helped to grow and to, and to persevere, not rule, not sovereignty, not... That, that belongs to God alone. That belongs to God alone. But if we can understand everything within the context of gift, and that what has been entrusted to our care is precious and fragile just as we are, then maybe we'll have an easier time of understanding that what we do up to, at the altar matters. It is a restoration of creation. And the words that we use when you do it matter. Because our words have the capacity to rise up, to raise up, or to tear down. Amen. Amen.